Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about DNA. Topic for the day is going to be transcription. So as far as DNA goes, there's really three big processes that you always need to know about replication, which was the last video, transcription, which is this one, and then translation, which will be the next one. So for today, here are the things I know, need you to know or be able to do by the end of the video. First one, explain the purpose and process of transcription. And the second one is to describe different types of mRNA modification. So that's what we got to do. Let's go ahead and get there, starting by talking about the central dogma of science. So this is like an idea that describes how information is transmitted within the cell. And when I talk about information being transmitted, I'm not talking about cell signaling. I'm talking about actual DNA information getting out and doing work in the cell. The flow of information always goes from DNA, so DNA has the information, to RNA. RNA is like the messenger, and then finally you get a protein which does the work. So recognize the central dogma of science is this flow of info from DNA to RNA to protein. Today's topic is transcription, and the reason that we have transcription is because DNA is just too big. It's this giant molecule, it's housed inside of the nucleus, and it cannot get out of the nucleus. But obviously, most of the things that DNA do does, English is hard, most of the things that DNA does occur outside the nucleus. So it's got to be able to send messages from where it is inside the nucleus to the outside of the nucleus, the cytoplasm of the cell. So that is what transition or transcription essentially does. Is transcription allows the DNA to produce a messenger that then goes out into the cytoplasm to get some work done. And I want you to note that as we are talking today, mRNA, which is going to be our major topic, doesn't actually do any work. It is just a messenger. It is messenger RNA because it carries a message. So DNA has got the information. It gives that information to the mRNA, which carries it as a message off to the ribosome, which is actually going to build the protein. Three steps to, well, most of the processes we're talking about have the th same three steps, initiation, elongation, termination. So for transcription, this is what it looks like. Always got to know where to start. So on our DNA, we talked about DNA being a long strand coiled up into chromosomes. So when transcription is going to occur, along our strand of DNA are genes. And these genes usually have, on one end, a promoter sequence. So only one side of the DNA is going to be transcribed at a time. This is called the template strand. And right here, this starting point is called the promoter. All right, promoter makes sense. It tells the RNA polymerase, which is what actually does the work, that this is where you need to start. Now, as with everything else in biology, it's more complicated than saying there's just a promoter here. Things that you need to know about this promoter. It consists of a code called the Tata box because there is a thiamine, adenine, thiamine, adenine. That is like the start dock here place. And if you look in these diagrams, there are a ton of different enzymes that form this initiation complex. We're not going to go through them in detail. Just know that at the start of the gene is our promoter region. The promoter region is where all of these enzymes bind up. Not until all of these enzymes are bound can the RNA polymerase bind to the template strand. Once the RNA polymerase is bound to the template strand, then it can go ahead and start transcribing the DNA to RNA. And remember that the Tata box is the place that says, hey, bind here. This is where we are starting our process of transcription. Next part of the show is elongation. And at this point, it is all RNA polymerase. Just like DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase matches up bases. RNA polymerase does the same thing, except for RNA polymerase is multi-talented. If you remember in replication, we talked about helicase going through and unwinding the DNA and separating the strands. Polymerase does the work of unwinding DNA. It does the work of separating the two sides of the DNA, and it does the work of matching up the bases and creating mRNA. So a couple things to note. Um, when we are in a strand of DNA and producing a copy in RNA, base pairing is important. So Blue strand's DNA, red strand is the growing strand of RNA. T in a DNA always pairs to an A in uh, RNA. So that's that same, T, DNA, R, RNA. 
sorry, words are hard. Let's show it one more time. T in the DNA is paired to A in the RNA. Here's the one that's different. If you have an A on the DNA, you have a U in the RNA. So usually in DNA, A pairs to T. If you're talking about RNA, A pairs to U. And then C to G is the exact same. So as far as elongation goes, we are making a strand of mRNA, which stands for messenger RNA. And this mRNA is what actually leaves the nucleus and goes to the cytoplasm. It is carrying the message from the DNA out into the cytoplasm where it can actually be done to use to do something. So this RNA polymerase cruises down the strand, unwinds it, unzips it, and then does all the base pairing to produce a strand of mRNA. Then obviously we have got to stop somewhere. So there is a sequence of uh, bases at the end of the gene called the terminator sequence, and that just tells the RNA polymerase, this is where you stop, this is where you fall off, this is where you stop building the strand of mRNA. Now, it's a little bit different between bacteria and eukaryotes. Bacteria and some simple prokaryotes, they just have a simple terminator sequence that says, hey, when you get this place, cut off the mRNA, let it go to the cytoplasm, stop doing your thing. In eukaryotes, there is a process called polyadenylation. And all that is, is the end sequence of the gene codes to put a bunch of adenyl groups or adenine groups onto your mRNA. So that mRNA strand will have all of its code. And then the last several bases will be a bunch of adenine, 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 adenine. When the mRNA, MR, sorry, when the RNA polymerase hits that polyadenylation sequence and sticks on all those adenines, it knows this is where we stop. And so the RNA polymerase falls off, the DNA rewinds, and that mRNA is now ready to get worked on. At this point, it's called pre-mRNA because it's got to be processed a little bit before we can send it out of the nucleus. The reason that we need to process it and modify it is a couple fold. Um, one, it usually cannot get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm until it's been processed. There's also different combinations of proteins we can get based on how we process this mRNA. So let's talk about a couple of those things as we wrap up our discussion for the day. First one, ridiculous picture, I know, but I couldn't find a good picture that talked about 5-cap and poly-A tail. Here's what this means. Um, our mRNA sequence, just like everything else with nucleic acids, has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. So let's say this is the 5' prime end. The 5' prime end gets a 5' prime cap, which is essentially a cap of bases that protects this end. On this end, it gets a poly A tail. We already talked about the end of it having a couple of adenine groups on it. Poly A tail is just going to add a whole bunch more on there. Essentially, what we are trying to do is we're trying to protect all of this information in the middle. So we're going to add an end to both sides to protect this RNA from being damaged or unraveled. The other thing that's important about this is if our mRNA does not have this 5' prime cap and the poly A tail, it cannot get out of the nucleus. So it's useless if it can't get out of the nucleus. Getting out of the nucleus doesn't happen unless it's got its cap and its tails. The other one that is really important is RNA splicing. Funny thing about DNA, forever, and I'm going to talk about an old model than a new model, forever and ever and ever, scientists thought that there were long strands of DNA that did not code for anything. They were there, but they didn't really do anything. So because mRNA is a direct like copy of the DNA, here's essentially what you would have. You would have a sequence that does code for some sort of protein, and then you'd have a sequence that didn't seem to have any information to make a protein, and then you'd have another part of the sequence that does make part of the protein. These guys that actually are expressed are called exons. The ones that were not thought to be expressed were called introns. Now, the reason I talk about this as an old model is just recently, within the last couple months, um, a study has come out that showed that introns, these guys right here, are actually really, really important. Forever they were thought to be junk DNA, just kind of useless. Um, but now they are thought to have some really important purposes in gene stabilization and protein production and other stuff. But as far as the machinery that reads this to build a protein, the ribosome is concerned, it doesn't want to see this sequence right here because that has no information for actually building the protein. So there is a set of enzymes that work together. They call, are called the spliceosome. And I'm sure I probably spelled this wrong, but they're called the spliceosome. And their whole purpose is to cut out this intron 
and sew those two exons together. So you've got one continuous strand of information. That is called RNA splicing. Now, there, the body can take this and cut this intron in a ton of different ways to get a bunch of different combinations. And this is known as alternative splicing. Based on how the body cuts out this intron, you can get a ton of different proteins from the same, essentially, uh, sequence of bases. So let's say you cut the whole thing out and you get hemoglobin or part of hemoglobin. Cut just half of it out, who knows, you might get a muscle protein. But by choosing how much of this intron is cut out, the body can get different variations of the protein from the same sequence of mRNA. And final thing, kind of an outlier, forever and ever and ever, scientists were sure that only proteins could catalyze this process of RNA splicing and repair and synthesis and all that stuff. In the 80s, there were some scientists, I believe it was at CU Boulder in Colorado, that showed that there are some types of RNA that can actually splice themselves. So let's say that they have got an intron that they need to cut out. They are actually able to coil over on themselves and cut out those strands of DNA and then reattach themselves. They are called ribozymes because they, in some ways, uh, serve the purpose of an enzyme, but they're also RNA. So just kind of recognize an RNA is an outlier in that it is able to carry out its own splicing without any, using any proteins or enzymes or anything like that. That was a lot of words. I hope you were able to track with it. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and hopefully we'll see you again.